I still can't believe Trump was shot in the ear two days ago. In God we trust indeed. But now, exploring the origins of lesbianism, which involves examining ancient human societies and early communities where survival hinged on cooperation and complex social structures rather than lust and greed, as it does today. And in early human societies, sexuality was probably not as rigidly defined either. Evidence from cave paintings, artifacts, and burial sites indicates that intimate relationships were often fluid. In ancient Mesopotamia, records of female partnerships, though rare, are surprisingly revealing. Texts and artifacts depict women in intimate bonds beyond friendship. In Sumer, goddess worship significantly influenced these relationships. Women often served as priestesses in temples of goddesses like Inanna, associated with love and sexuality. These priestesses formed close communities, almost always with erotic bonds. By the way, in the animal kingdom, the habit is not as rare as one might think. Frankly, lesbianism in animals has intrigued biologists for decades. One of the earliest examples was observed in Japanese macaques. Studies in the 1950s documented female macaques engaging in mating behaviors, such as mounting and grooming, with other females. Similar behaviors have been noted in bottlenose dolphins, where female dolphins form long-lasting bonds involving sexual activities. Another notable species is the Laysan albatross. Research in 2008 found that 31% of albatross pairs on Oahu's Kaina Point were female-female. These pairs played crucial roles in raising chicks, showing that lesbian pairings can benefit species' survival. And animal lesbianism isn't confined to mammals and birds. It has been observed in reptiles, amphibians, and insects as well. For instance, studies on the garter snake have shown female-female courtship during mating season. These behaviors suggest that lesbianism in animals might be rooted in evolutionary strategies, social structures, and survival mechanisms. The story of lesbianism in ancient Greek culture is deeply intertwined with the poet Sappho, who lived on the island of Lesbos in the 6th century BC. Celebrated for its emotional depth and focus on female passion, Sappho's poetry provided an intimate glimpse into the lives of ancient Greek women. Her fragments describe love and admiration for women, forming one of the earliest literary references to female same-sex relationships. The island of Lesbos on which she lived became synonymous with female same-sex relationships, attracting women from all over Greece, seeking a community to express their love freely. This era in Greece was marked by a liberal attitude towards different kinds of sexuality, including same-sex relationships. However, the modern concept of lesbianism did not exist in the form you're thinking it existed. Hordes of beautiful women piled up on the island of Lesbos, having a good time, right? No, that would be awesome, but ancient Greek lesbian relationships were often seen as companionship and intellectual connection rather than purely physical attraction. Sappho's work immortalized these connections, ensuring their place in history, and we'll always be thankful to her for that. Her poetry, though surviving in fragments, has had an undeniable impact, inspiring countless interpretations and rekindling interest in ancient Greek naughty gals. But outside the island of Lesbos, in ancient Greece, women's roles were mostly confined to household duties, limiting their public and social interactions. However, in regions like Sparta, women enjoyed more freedom and autonomy. There, female companionship thrived, with same-sex relationships being highly encouraged. Vase paintings and sculptures from Sparta, for example, depicted women in affectionate embraces, hinting at deeper connections. The veneration of goddesses like Aphrodite also framed these relationships within the context of love and desire. Thus, while not formally recognized or institutionalized, lesbian relationships in ancient Greece found expression through cultural and artistic channels. And now, looking into ancient Rome, known for its complex social structures and cultural institutions, which also had notable views on sexuality. While male homosexual activity in ancient Rome is well documented, female same-sex relationships are often understudied. Thankfully, Roman literature and historical records from Seneca and Martial offer glimpses into lesbianism in ancient Rome. The term tribus, derived from the Greek tribine, meaning to rub, described women who engaged in sexual activities with other women. Sexual relations there were often viewed through dominance and social status. Male citizens were expected to assert dominance, complicating perceptions of female same-sex relationships. These relationships were seen as challenges to male authority and societal norms. Like in ancient Greece, in ancient Roman society, women's roles were predominantly domestic as well, often limiting their public presence, but women from elite backgrounds enjoyed greater autonomy and influence, often facilitating same-sex relationships. Artifacts like frescoes and pottery sometimes depict women in intimate settings, suggesting romantic connections. Epigraphic evidence, such as epitaphs and inscriptions, provides insight into female same-sex relationships in ancient Rome as well. 
Some tombstones and memorial plaques celebrate bonds between women. A notable example is the inscription of Claudia Metrodora, who dedicated a heartfelt epitaph to her female companion. Notable figures like the poet Marshall satirized and criticized women who pursued other women, reflecting broader societal skepticism. While intended to ridicule, these texts inadvertently confirm the presence and awareness of lesbianism in Roman society. The frequent appearance of same-sex themes in literature, satire, and graffiti suggests that these relationships, though marginalized, were relatively common. Next up, we're going to rub the surface of lesbianism in ancient Egypt. Hang in there, it's just going to take a minute or two, and then we're moving on to good old weird Japan, where there are no limits to how strange things can get sexually. But first, ancient Egypt, that has a few surprises up its sleeve as well. The concept of lesbianism in ancient Egypt is intriguing due to the scarcity of explicit documentation, yet fascinating insights emerge from historical accounts and artifacts. Papyrus from Deir el Medina hints at same-sex relationships among women in this worker community near Thebes. This village housed workers and artisans who built the royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings. One notable artifact, the Turin erotic papyrus, primarily depicts heterosexual couples but suggests an environment where sensuality and desire were acknowledged. Additionally, personal letters in ostraca, or inscribed pottery shards from Deir el Medina, contain affectionate language between women. These exchanges might indicate deep friendships or romantic relationships, or something even deeper than that. The role of women in religious rites in ancient Egypt is also significant. Priestesses of goddesses like Hathor and Isis participated in rituals celebrating fertility, love, and sexuality, blurring the lines between the sacred and sensual. These practices allowed explorations of same-sex desire within a socially accepted framework. Same-sex relationships might have been private there due to societal norms, but the cultural emphasis on harmony and balance most likely allowed space for various forms of love. Temples and religious precincts, central to social and cultural life, provided women with settings to form close, potentially romantic bonds in a private and respected context. The integration of love and spirituality in these spaces makes everyone happy who is a friend of lesbianism and lesbians in general. And let's be honest, who isn't? And now, just like I promised, here's maybe the oddest country in the history of the world, taking into consideration their overflowing lust and sexual liberty. Here's lesbianism in ancient Japan. In ancient Japan, the origins of lesbianism are intertwined with unique cultural and social structures. The Heian period, spanning from 794 to 1185, serves as a starting point for understanding these connections. Aristocratic women, often secluded in court life, formed intense emotional bonds. Literary works like The Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikibu provide glimpses into these relationships, though often coded and veiled. Buddhist nunneries also became focal points during this era. Women seeking refuge from societal expectations or devoted to spiritual life found solace and companionship within these religious establishments. These environments sometimes fostered deep same-sex emotional and physical connections, seen as spiritually motivated or a form of ascetic practice. Additionally, waka poetry played a role in expressing these affections. This form of poetry, characterized by emotional expressiveness and brevity, allowed subtle communication of desires and affections between women. While explicit references to lesbian relationships are scarce, hints and nuances in literary and historical records suggest a rich tapestry of same-sex relationships. The absence of overt condemnation in many texts hints at a nuanced, if not accepting, view of these relationships during this period. During the Edo period, from 1603 to 1868, same-sex relationships, including lesbianism, became more openly documented. The rise of Yoshiwara, the pleasure quarters in Edo, modern Tokyo, created a space for liberated sexual expression. Within these licensed quarters, courtesans sometimes formed intimate relationships for companionship and emotional support. These relationships were recorded in woodblock prints and literature, offering insights into their dynamics. Kabuki theater added complexity to the understanding of same-sex relationships. Female kabuki performers, called anagata, originally played both male and female roles, captivating audiences with their beauty and talent. Offstage, they often engaged in romantic and sexual relationships with other women. Social acceptance of these relationships fluctuated, but they were an undeniable part of the cultural landscape. Legal and societal attitudes varied. While there was no explicit legal prohibition against same-sex relations among women, societal norms and family expectations often dictated discretion. The Meiji period, dating from 1868 to 1912, marked profound changes in Japanese society, driven by westernization and modernization. 
the government aimed to centralize and unify the nation, leading to the replacement of traditional and samurai customs with Western norms. This shift affected the visibility and acceptance of same-sex relationships, including lesbianism. During this era, romantic friendships among women became prominent. These intense, often lifelong relationships were socially tolerated and sometimes encouraged. Meiji literature provides examples of such relationships, marked by deep emotional bonds and occasional physical intimacy. Novels and poetry depicted the depth and intensity of these friendships, capturing their romantic aspects without explicitly labeling them as same-sex relationships. Educational institutions, especially women's schools, played a crucial role in fostering these romantic friendships. Female students, living and studying together, developed close bonds seen as a normal part of their social and emotional growth. Teachers sometimes viewed these relationships as beneficial, believing they promoted moral and intellectual development. The Meiji period's ambivalent stance allowed these relationships to flourish within a limited but meaningful context. To me, it sounds like this Meiji guy was pretty great, after all at least about lesbians. During the Taisho period, from 1912 to 1926, Japan evolved rapidly with increasing Western influences shaping social attitudes. The concept of Class S relationships emerged, characterized by deep emotional connections between schoolgirls and young women, often without physical intimacy. These relationships were seen as youthful expression and generally accepted by society. Class S relationships were prominent in all girls' schools, where students formed intense bonds, Women's magazines and novels of the Taisho period frequently featured stories celebrating these connections. Writers like Nobuko Yoshia, known for pioneering works on same-sex love, brought visibility to these relationships through stories highlighting deep affection and admiration between female characters. Despite societal acceptance of Class S relationships as a phase of adolescence, they were expected to be temporary, ending once women entered adulthood and pursued traditional roles in marriage and family. During Japan's early Showa period, from 1926 to 1989, societal norms shifted under militarization and World War II. Emphasis on traditional family roles and nationalistic values reduced the acceptance of same-sex relationships, including those between women. The government promoted heterosexual marriage and reproduction, pressuring conformity. In urban areas like Tokyo, underground subcultures emerged, discreetly exploring same-sex relationships. Cafes and bars in entertainment districts served as meeting places for women seeking same-sex companionship, operating under the radar, and offering a haven for non-conformists. As Japan transitioned into the latter half of the 20th century, the understanding and acceptance of lesbianism evolved. The global women's liberation movement of the 1960s and 1970s significantly influenced Japanese society, fostering awareness and acceptance of diverse sexual orientations, including lesbianism. Media representation improved, with television shows, films, and literature featuring more complex and positive portrayals of lesbian characters and relationships. This shift helped normalize and destigmatize same-sex relationships in broader society. Despite these advancements, challenges persist. Societal pressures and legal recognition of same-sex relationships remain contentious. However, growing visibility and support systems in urban areas indicate a gradual shift towards greater acceptance. Thus, Japan, with a wonderfully beautiful history of lesbianism, once again moves towards being all jolly and gay. And who could be sad when hearing that? I'm even considering buying a plane ticket to Japan right now. Before we can hop on to more modern times in lesbianism, let's see what the church thought about lesbians in Middle Ages. The Middle Ages in Europe, spanning from the 5th to the late 15th century, witnessed complex attitudes and limited understanding of same-sex relationships. As you can guess, Christian doctrine significantly influenced views on lesbianism. The medieval church condemned all non-procreative sex, including same-sex relations, labeling them as sodomy. Church's penitentials, handbooks for confessors, listed specific penances for women engaging in sexual acts with one another, such as fasting, pilgrimages, or other forms of penance lasting several years. During the medieval period, marriages were mainly arranged to strengthen alliances, secure property, and ensure lineage continuation. Despite these and other similar societal norms, historical records indicate women expressed love and affection for each other as well. Hildegard of Bingen, a 12th century abbess and mystic, provides an example. Her writings describe intense spiritual and emotional relationships between women, hinting at same-sex unions. Medieval literature, such as the French Romance of the Rose and Chaucer's Legend of Good Women, includes stories of passionate friendships and relationships between women. Additionally, some court records and legal cases from medieval Europe document women living together as couples, occasionally adopting male attire to present as heterosexual pairs and avoid suspicion. 
But what influenced the view on lesbianism the most, probably, was the medieval medical understanding of sexuality and the human body. Based on ancient Greek and Roman theories, medieval medicine believed in balancing bodily humors. Women engaging in same-sex activities were viewed through these medical theories, attributing such behavior to an imbalance of humors. For instance, excessive heat or passion could explain same-sex attraction. Many medical texts, such as those by Avicenna and other prominent medieval physicians, discussed female homoeroticism, but in veiled or ambiguous terms. Despite the medical community's attempts to rationalize these behaviors, underlying social taboos and religious condemnations persisted. But thankfully for the lesbians, urban environments in medieval Europe, such as Paris, London, and Florence, provided contexts for same-sex female relationships to emerge. These bustling cities offered anonymity and spaces for women to connect. Social networks and subcultures in urban areas discreetly allowed the expression of same-sex desires. Guilds, markets, and communal settings facilitated interactions among women, creating opportunities for romantic or affectionate bonds. Legal records occasionally reveal cases of women living together or accused of same-sex relations. For instance, 15th century court documents from Florence mention women accused of sodomy, reflecting urban authorities' attempts to control sexuality. Despite risks, some women maintained same-sex relationships, navigating societal norms and legal constraints to find companionship and love. These urban interactions enhanced the understanding of lesbianism in medieval Europe, showing that love and desire flourished in various settings, from convents to cities, and what a beautiful love it must have been. But that's enough with church-driven Europe. Let's move on to the continent where the sun is always up, the magnificent Africa. Lesbianism has deep historical roots in various African cultures, often challenging the perception that same-sex relationships are a Western import. In pre-colonial Benin, women who refused to marry men were sometimes recognized as man-women, taking on roles and responsibilities typically reserved for males. Similar practices were observed among the Lovedu people in South Africa, where women-upon-women -women marriages were not uncommon. These marriages were often economic or social contracts, facilitating alliances and inheritance rights, rather than being purely romantic. Across Africa, historical examples of female same-sex relationships are varied and complex. In Uganda, King Wanga II of Buganda had a harem with both men and women, allowing same-sex relationships among his courtiers. The Nyakusa people of Tanzania recognized mummy baby bonds between older and younger women, differing from societal expectations of womanhood. These relationships provided emotional and economic support, sometimes evolving into intimate bonds. In modern Sudan, female same-sex relationships existed among the Tuareg, where women formed loving partnerships accepted within their communities. Despite colonial and post-colonial pressures to conform to Western heteronormative models, these traditions have shown resilience, maintaining a presence in many African societies. During the colonial period, European powers imposed their ideals on African societies, criminalizing and marginalizing these relationships. Yet, the resilience of these traditions can be seen today, as modern African movements draw strength from their ancestral past. Key figures and communities across the continent continue to celebrate and reclaim these aspects of their heritage. Understanding the historical basis for lesbianism in Africa, and before we talk about modern times, let's view the pre-colonial Americas as well, because they were and are a sweet people who must not be forgotten. In pre-colonial Americas, diverse indigenous cultures exhibited a wide range of gender and sexual identities, including what we now recognize as lesbianism. A notable example is the two-spirit identity in many Native American cultures, which includes various gender expressions and sexual orientations, such as lesbian women. Two-spirit individuals often held esteemed positions, contributing to spiritual, social, and political life. Anthropological studies of the Mojave people reveal Aliha, biological males adopting female roles, and Hwame, biological females assuming male roles. Hwame often formed same-sex partnerships with other women, reflecting acceptance of lesbian relationships. Such identities were not only acknowledged, but revered in many native societies. The Maya civilization, renowned for its advanced writing and astronomical systems, also exhibited diverse sexual behaviors. Maya codices contained depictions and references hinting at same-sex female relationships. Though many codices were lost or destroyed during the Spanish conquest, they reveal a broader understanding of sexuality unrestricted by European norms. The arrival of European settlers significantly disrupted existing gender and sexual dynamics in the Americas. They imposed strict religious and cultural norms, viewing indigenous practices through a moralistic lens and seeking to eradicate what they deemed deviant behavior. This included targeting same-sex relationships and fluid gender identities, often through brutal methods. Missionaries played a crucial role, 
actively converting native populations to Christianity and enforcing rigid heteronormative principles, undermining social structures that embraced the good kind of diversity. Colonial laws criminalized same-sex relationships, and indigenous peoples were often forced to abandon their cultural practices under threat of violence or death. Despite these oppressive measures, the rich history of lesbian relationships in pre-colonial Americas testifies to the resilience and complexity of indigenous cultures. Many Native American communities continue to honor and revive traditional understandings of gender and sexuality, celebrating the diversity that was once commonplace. And last but not least, the modern times, where no one understands what's happening, or at least I don't apparently. But nonetheless, let's take a look. The term lesbian, as we already discussed, originates from the Greek island of Lesbos, home to the poet Sappho around 600 BC. Thus, Sappho's poetry, often expressing love for other women, laid an early foundation for the concept of lesbianism. In the 19th century, lesbianism gained prominence in Western societies. Anne Lister, an English landowner and diarist, documented her romantic relationships with women in detailed journals from the early 1800s. Lister's diaries, initially written in a secret code and deciphered years later, are considered the first extensive documentation of lesbian life in modern Europe, earning her the title of first modern lesbian. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, lesbianism gained visibility through literature and sexology studies, notably influenced by Richard von Kraft Ebing's Psychopathia Sexualis, one of the first modern texts to discuss female homosexuality in a scientific context. In the early 20th century, lesbianism's visibility evolved, especially in artistic and intellectual circles of cities like Paris, Berlin, and New York. By the 1920s, these cities became vibrant hubs for lesbian communities. Influential figures such as American expatriates Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas in Paris hosted literary salons, creating spaces for open discussions on lesbianism. Between the World Wars, Germany's Weimar Republic allowed some openness, with Berlin becoming famous for its lesbian nightlife, featuring clubs, bars, and publications. Pioneering publications like Die Freundin provided platforms for lesbian voices. However, the rise of the Nazi regime in the 1930s led to severe repression, forcing many lesbian communities underground. During the 1950s and 1960s, lesbianism was largely stigmatized globally, suppressed by conservative societal norms. Despite this, underground networks and bars emerged, offering secret meeting spaces for lesbians. The 1969 Stonewall Riots in New York City marked a pivotal moment, igniting activism and increasing visibility for the community. These events paved the way for the lesbian movements of the 1970s, leading to gradual acceptance and rights for lesbians in modern times. Today, lesbian visibility and acceptance have vastly improved through activism, media representation, and legal advancements. And of course, because you keep watching it on Cornhub. Thanks so much for staying until the end, because as you know, the end is always the sweetest. Have a cookie and enjoy the rest of your evening watching our fast and informative documentaries. Your weird history provider, history but fast.